In this video, we're going to look at uh, creating mathematical models uh, using difference equations to describe systems that don't come from the uh, relatively simple world of finance. Uh, so as we've seen in the previous examples, interest and payments are very well defined. And so writing down the rules is basically just recognizing a formula. But when it comes to other systems like, say, in biology, we're going to find that it's a little bit more difficult to describe the change uh, in the state of the system. And so we're going to have to use uh, both empirical observations, uh, our intuition, and actually some data as well to try to formulate a model. So in this video, we're going to look at one particular example. We're going to look at the growth of a yeast population. All right. And so if you look in your textbooks in figure 1.7, they actually have this nice little table uh, and plot for you where we've got uh, the time in hours and the biomass. Uh, I believe this was in uh, probably grams or milligrams. Uh, and uh, we're, so we can see how those quantities are changing over time. And then the question is, how do we actually build a model to describe this? All right. So I have plotted the data here in a couple of different ways to help us get started. You'll notice uh, in the first plot, what we have is the time versus the biomass. And one way to build a model would be to try to fit some sort of curve, say uh, an exponential function maybe, uh, to this data. And we could use some of our transformations, like the logarithmic transformations that we discussed in the previous unit, to actually find what the right type of model would be for that. The challenge with just fitting a curve to the data is that it doesn't give us a lot of understanding of why the, the quantity is growing in that way. And so a, we may want to offer a difference equation instead in that it can give us a little more intuitions about how the system actually works. So to help us with that, uh, there are a couple of things that you could look at. Uh, you could look at, say, uh, the time in hours. So now I'm not talking about the middle plot. Uh, the time in hours is the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis is the change in biomass. Uh, and you could imagine trying to fit some sort of line through that and see how the change in biomass varies over time. I would argue that that doesn't look particularly linear, uh, so maybe that wouldn't be the best approach. On the other hand, though, if you plot the biomass versus the change in biomass, then you start to see what looks a little bit like a linear trend. So on the right, uh, again, the horizontal axis, think of that as the variable we're trying to predict, uh, and then the vertical axis as the, uh, the change from one observation to the next. And you notice that a proportionality relationship seems relatively plausible here. So you might imagine trying to find some sort of line of best fit that goes through the data. Uh, that's not a great line, but you could imagine something of that form to try to capture the relationship there. So a reasonable hypothesis based on this picture is that the change in uh, P, where P is the population of yeast or the biomass, might be equal to some constant times the value of P. All right, so let's see if we can work with that. All right, so if you uh, use your computer, you could do some sort of linear regression and fit a line Y equals MX to that what you would find is actually the slope of that line uh, on the right would be around 1 half. So actually, our model can be made more specific. Delta P should be approximately 0.5 times Pn, which means Pn plus 1 should be approximately the old value, Pn, plus the change, which if we simplify, it would be just 1.5 times Pn. And what that would mean is that every hour we would expect that the uh, new population is going to be about 50% higher than the previous population. All right, so we can put down uh, a nice model there. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the nice thing about this approach is that it gives us a little bit insight uh, insight about why the system behaves that way the way that it does. Notice that since we found empirically that the change uh, in the population was proportional to the population, that suggests that ultimately the driving factor is reproduction. Uh, the more yeast that we have, the more new yeast that we get as a result. And so the fact that the change is one half of Pn would suggest that perhaps uh, half of the yeast roughly uh, will uh, reproduce each hour or perhaps every two hours on average each yeast will uh, double uh, to uh, 
increase the biomass that we're dealing with here. So notice that's a little more informative than just saying P is equal to 13.77 e to the 0.42 t, which is what you'd get if you tried to fit a model, an exponential model, to that data. Okay, so let's try to evaluate these models. So uh, we mentioned a lot of different techniques for doing this. One of the, the common ones that we discussed earlier in the semester was using the R squared value. Uh, remember, R squared measures the proportion of the variability in the data that is described by the model. And uh, in this case, depending on exactly how you fit it, you can get an R squared value that's as high as 0.98. So that's a pretty good fit. And so when you might say that, hey, based on the data we have, this is a pretty good model. On the other hand, it's a good idea when you propose a model just to think about some of the implications of that, because you may find that the model does have some limitations. So for example, here, uh, there's a big problem. If you actually find a nice explicit formula, uh, uh, you'll see that the population after n steps is going to be 1.5 raised to the n times the initial population. And so in other words, this predict predicts that the population will grow and grow and grow, uh, and it's going to grow faster and faster and faster. And if you project that forward in time, what you'll find is that the population will diverge, it will go off to infinity, uh, and it, within a week, the population of the yeast in a small little petri dish will somehow surpass the weight of the entire planet. So the point is here that something is missing. This is actually not a great model, uh, at least not for large values of n. Maybe it works well for small n, uh, but if we want to capture the population growth more holistically, we're going to need to incorporate something else into the model. All right. Try that again. All right, so we're back, <laughs> froze for a moment. Okay, so in the previous model, uh, what we chose is to model that the, cha the change in pain is being proportional to uh, the, the change in uh, population, rather, is being proportional to the population itself. Uh, but as we saw, this leads to unbounded growth, exponential growth, and so if we want to improve the model, we're going to need to adjust this a little bit. And if you collect more data, you'll see that indeed, uh, there is evidence that this exponential growth does not continue. Uh, so here, uh, this is a table also taken for your textbook, where instead of observing for just a few hours, we observe for a total of uh, 18 hours, and you see that the growth, although initially uh, it is very, very fast, it does slow down as time progresses, and it looks like there's actually might be a horizontal asymptote here, uh, and my estimates are that that's somewhere around 650. In fact, I believe 665 uh, seems pretty plausible uh, based on the table that we see over on the left. Okay, so there's some sort of horizontal as asymptote, and that's just a rough estimate. So we might want to take that into account when building our model. Okay, in order to do that, though, we have to think about why. What is it that causes the population to stop growing? Why, why would we expect to see some sort of horizontal asymptote here? Uh, and there are a number of factors that might come to mind. Uh, for example, there may be limited space. If we're growing in, a, growing in a petri dish, there just may not be room for the yeast to continue to grow. There may be limited resources, not enough food, not enough oxygen uh, for respiration to continue. And at some point, they may just uh, be all on top of each other. All of the yeast could be just stacked up so high so that the yeast in the middle isn't actually able to uh, get enough oxygen for respiration. Uh, there could be waste, which causes a toxic environment. Uh, there could be other factors. Uh, there's lots of things that could cause the growth to slow down. But ultimately, I think all of these could be summarized uh, with a single idea that given the environment that yeast is in, there is some sort of limiting capacity. You cannot have more than a certain amount of yeast in a petri dish. At some point, it's just not possible for it to continue to grow. All right, so how can we incorporate this into the model? Well, what we should do is when we think about the change is that we would like to make it so that when we start to get near that carrying capacity, the capacity of the environment, uh, the, the growth should slow and should approach zero. Uh, and if we exceed that capacity, if we try to cram more yeast than can possibly survive there, then the growth rate should actually become negative. And one way to do that would be to assume that the chain should be proportional to 665 minus the population. So notice if the population is bigger than 665, that would be negative. If it's smaller than 665, it's positive. And if it's equal to 665, that would be zero. 
And so based on that, we've had two proportionality relationships that we've hypothesized, one that the change is proportional to P, other that it's proportional to 665 minus P. And so we can merge them together into the model that's shown below. And in this case, we're saying that it's proportional to the product of both of them. All right. And so now we would like to then evaluate this model and see if it does a better job than the one that we started with. Okay, so one way to do this is again to use a graphical approach. We can graph the quantity on the right hand side without the proportionality constant. So that's our horizontal axis, P times 665 minus P. Uh, and on the vertical axis, we can plot the actual change. Uh, so we've got that here. And notice that if this indeed this is a true proportionality relationship, then we would expect to have some sort of line through the origin that captures the trend, the relationship between delta P and P665, uh, 665 minus P. And indeed, when you draw the graph, uh, there is a nice linear fit that you can generate, and uh, it has a slope of 0 0.00082. All right, so that suggests that the right model for the change has that form, uh, and this should do a much better job than what we started with. Uh, a couple other things to note. Notice that in the early stages, if P is much less than 665, then this term up here is approximately just 665, right? If the P is really small, we can sort of throw the thing away, which means delta P is still K times P, which is what we started with. So this model actually incorporates the original model uh, but it only uses that sort of relationship when P is small, but when P uh, is large, close to 665, then uh, what we have is delta P, if P is uh, approximately equal to 665, then delta P is approximately zero, so the growth would slow down, and that's why we see this asymptotic behavior. All right, and if you then compute a numerical solution for that difference equation and uh, generate a nice table for the predictions, you can even plot them, uh, the true values over time versus the predicted values over time, or alternatively, you can pl plot observed versus predicted. And if we've done well, then we'd expect those to be relatively close to the line with slope one meaning the predicted and the observed should be approximately equal to each other. Uh, and it's clear from the plot on the left that we seem to do a pretty good job at the very beginning and the end, uh, although in the intermediate range, maybe there is a little bit of, gap, of a gap. And so perhaps there would be a way to continue to refine this model to improve from there. All right, but at the very least, that gives us a starting point for thinking about these uh, more complicated modeling problems. Empirically, we can use data, uh, we can visualize the data, plotting the change versus P or some function of P. Uh, and once we've identified a proportionality relationship, we can use that to actually create the change term for our difference equation model.